Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Policies and Practices. Uh, welcome to a webinar dedicated to an essential uh, and urgent topic, tackling EU road transport emissions, how electrification can be a path to climate uh, neutrality. So as we are all the way achieving the EU's goal of uh, uh, climate neutrality by 2050 is of paramount importance, uh, particularly through the reduction of road transport emissions. Um, transport emissions is responsible for almost 25% of EU greenhouse gas emissions. And within this sector, road transport accounted for 75 of these emissions. Um, so if we have to meet our climate goals, transitioning to electric vehicles is not uh, uh, just beneficial, but essential. So today we will focus on several topics, uh, such as uh, policy and incentives, uh, infrastructure expansion, and technological innovation. Uh, so we are excited to welcome our four panelists uh, today. Thank you very much. So Lucie Matera, you're the Secretary, Secretary General of Charger Europe. Uh, this is the voice of the electrical vehicle charging infrastructure uh, industry. Um, I just want to add, we, we organized this, this webinar with the company Edenred, uh, which is part of Charge Up Europe. So Edenred is a, a member of your organization. Thank you very much for being here. Sarah Shada, you, you lead the Climate Group's EV100 campaign for France. Uh, that's a global initiative and brings together uh, companies committed to acceler accelerating uh, the transition to electric vehicles uh, worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Victoria Leonenko, uh, your Senior Policy Advisor Electromobility for the French Union of Electricity the EUFE, and Yannick Perez, you're a professor of energy economics and mobility in the Industrial Engineering Lab of Central Supélec School uh, of Engineering at University Paris-Saclay. Hello. Thank you very much uh, to the four of you. Thank you for joining us today, uh, and we look forward to an, uh, an informative session today. Uh, I just want to say to the audience um, that you can feel free to use the Q&A box uh, on Zoom, uh, if you have any questions to our panelists, so you have the little Q&A uh, module, uh, so we, we will be glad to answer your, your questions. So first of all, uh, we will have uh, several presentations. Uh, Lucy Matera, uh, for Charge Up Europe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arthur. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so Charge Up Europe, as you mentioned, Arthur is the voice of the EV charging infrastructure industry. So within Charge Up, we have the full EV charging value chain. So we have um, hardware producers, right, who make the, the charging stations. Um, what we call charge point operators, so people who deploy and maintain networks, mobility service providers who are more on the side of um, uh, payment and, and invoicing. Okay, so that's us. Um, I will start with a very, really brief um, overview of the landscape, the moment, the political moment where we are today, and then I'm going to give you a quick sense of what's on our radar uh, at the moment, what's going to be on our radar for the next um, few months as we, you know, go into a new um, political moment uh, at EU level. So, as you all know by now, we are at a fairly pivotal moment, right? So we're waiting for the new slate of EU commissioners, that is the EU executive, to come in. That should come sometime uh, in the course of uh, the second half of the year. And uh, once they are um, nominated, formally appointed uh, at the European Commission, then they will set out the priorities of uh, the EU's executive for the next five years. Okay, so we, we have in that sort of interim period where we don't know what will be the priorities of the new European Commission, but we do know the priorities of um, a fairly important other institutional um, body in the EU, which is called the European Council, that the, the heads of state and, and government of the EU. Um, so we know what is their mindset. We know where they stand. We know e-mobility, the European Green Deal in general, um, is not going to be as prioritized as it was, uh, you know, under the previous uh, five years. Um, we have an agenda that is policy, political agenda that is shaping up to be a little bit more defensive, I would say, a little bit more of a closed off uh, Europe um, is shaping up. 
Um, we do think there's still room to um, progress a lot of topics that are relevant for the industry. So there's a really useful welcome focus on uh, the single market. Uh, you know, we have hardware producers who actually need to develop different versions of the same chargers um, before being able to place them on the EU market, which I think in 2024 is slightly uh, mind boggling. Uh, so hopefully we see some progress here. There's a lot of focus, attention on um, competitiveness, industrial, industrial policy, etc. No one really knows what that means. Uh, it's a nice, you know, buzzword uh, with not a lot of uh, substance and content attached. Uh, but we do think there's good thing that could be sort of plugged or attached to that political priority, starting with the grid, uh, which is one of those topics that is sort of linked to immobility that hasn't been yet fully politicized and uh, toxified. So that would be, I think, it's something that we can we can use. Uh, there's general sense that uh, the ease of doing business in Europe uh, should be increased. I think no one is going to be uh, against that. Uh, so potentially, I mean, there's potential for red tape to be to be cut. Um, and again, I think no one will uh, object to, uh, to that direction. If indeed we, we that's that's the that's where we're going. And energy security, we expect that that will stay high on the agenda for um, the next five years. And of course, here with EV charging, you know, there's a lot of very positive things that we can say, you know, how we contribute to the stability uh, of uh, energy systems, their modernization, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's not, you know, the, the mood music is different, right? You know, you're not going to hear words like, you know, um, need to fight climate change or European Green Deal. Those, I think, big, catchy words, uh, buzzwords are going to go away, but that doesn't mean that there's no, you know, no options or no venue to, to make progress. Hmm? Now, all of that, as you know, is happening against the background of um, some tensions, right? <laughs> uh, some have to do with our external partners. We just saw the European Commission yesterday uh, confirming those uh, provisional duties on um, Chinese EVs or rather EVs manufactured in China imported into Europe, right? So not just Chinese EVs, it's actually other brands too. Uh, that would de facto... Um, regardless of the merits of this investigation, uh, that will de facto increase the price of uh, EVs in Europe. And we know that price is a big, you know, um, deterrent for for, EV, for for drivers today to uh, switch from the, the, the IC to, uh, to EVs. So that's, yeah, those developments should be kept in mind. Um, and there's some very, you know, unhelpful <laughs> background noise uh, from some, uh, some on the political spectrum. Um, around 2035 and the IC phase out and it ended up too fast, shouldn't be revisiting uh, this uh, this target, etc. Of course, we think it's a terrible idea. This is the main policy signal for investment uh, and it's crucial to maintain those policy signals because indeed you have <laughs> massive investment being rolled out. If you remove the policy signals, then, you know, that will ha just having that conversation has an impact on investment, right? So we should, we should be aware of that. So that's, yeah, the overall, let's say, uh, picture as we see it. Um, I'm going to go into our topics, but maybe as a short preamble, I always like to use those moments to uh, debunk some myths. So if we could bring uh, the first slide um, and you will see that would be, yeah. So it looks like a lot of information, but it's not so much. So we're going to start with the left side, right? And so the left side, that's not our data, first of all, that's the data from the European Commission. So you can trust uh, this data. Um, what you can see uh, is the, the, the targets, right? So targets that are prescribed by EU law for the deployment of public charging infrastructure. Okay. So you have a framework uh, which has been put in place at the EU level, which is called AFIR, Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Regulation. And that framework sets targets um, binding target for the member states, uh, they need to deploy a certain amount of public charging infrastructure across the EU. Um, that is represented on the slide by the blue dot, right? And the orange uh, bars that you see, that is the effective actual, right? Deployment of EV charging infrastructure target on the ground today, right? So I'm going to give you the summary of uh, that left part. 26 out of 27 member states today meet their targets for the deployment of public charging infrastructure. Okay, so that's something that you should keep in mind because one of the, you know, one of the <laughs> things I'm hearing a lot in Brussels is you are not deploying fast enough, you are not deploying fast enough, you are not deploying fast enough, but actually 26 out of 27 members said already meet their targets today in the framework that actually um, uh, was implemented uh, just three months ago. Okay, so I think we're, we're doing fine on public charging. So that's one bit that I always like to uh, remind people of. 
on the right side, I think it's good for you to see also what is the respective share of public charging, right? So what you do in the street versus private charging. Okay, so in Brussels, hmm, around 90% of the policy discussion is about uh, public charging. And we understand that it captures the mind, uh, that captures the imagination. Uh, but the reality of charging is that it is a private thing, right? It is done in private settings so that they would be at home, at the workplace, etc. So that's the blue bar that you're seeing and the gray bar, okay? Which is the vast majority of charging today in Europe. Okay, so we would like to see a little bit of a rebalancing in the discussion in Brussels between public charging and private charging. Okay, you can take the slide down. I hope everybody feels educated uh, by that slide. I will move um, to uh, some of our topic. So what's on our radar for the next few months, next few years? Um, deployment is, um, of course, still a priority. Uh, that's still very much dominating the policy debate today, right? So whenever a policymaker is thinking about EV charging, the first thing they're going to think about is, oh, deployment, deployment, you know, how many chargers on the ground, okay? Which is one small aspect of the discussion, but we accept uh, that uh, that is important to policymakers. So as I said, public charging, there is no framework in place, which is called AFIR. Targets are more or less met. Um, what, do, what we do want to see um, is um, a new approach, not uh, an approach of fragmentation across member states, um, which is always a bit of a risk uh, with the EU. We are seeing that happening. We're seeing some different approaches to payment provisions. We're always seeing, you know, Germany uh, doing its own thing and then France doing its own thing. And that's not helpful when you're, you know, on the set of industry because what you're looking for is scale, right? And uh, fragmentation across the single market doesn't allow you to scale, okay? So we are trying to get the member state grouped, um, stay in a pack <laughs> and not get too creative with the implementation. Um, there's another framework that is important, which is called EPBD. That's, um, has more or less nothing to do uh, with charging. It uh, looks at biddings. And within that framework, which, which is really about bidding, there is one article about charging in biddings. So that's what we need to uh, work with for those 80, 85% of, of charging today. Um, it's an important framework because it's a democratization framework. It will bring charging closer to, to people, to closer to where we live. And here, of course, we wanna make sure that uh, we have the right deployment. So that's the deployment conversation. And I'm almost finished. What we really want to uh, encourage policymakers to do is to look at the other piece of the conversation, which is much more interesting, which is integration with energy systems, right? That's not really working today. Um, that's not working on, on many levels. Uh, that's not working because the, uh, we're seeing a lot of congestions uh, on the grid. We're seeing uh, connection timelines that are very, very long. You know, in EV charging project, it's three to six months to get it, you know, off the ground, and then you wait two years for your <laughs> great connection. So of course, that's a bit of a, an issue here. Uh, but again, that's more looking at the, the you know, the, the the physical kind of thing, the physical side of things. I know also on the call we want to uh, talk about some of the aspects that we are a little bit more excited about uh, around smart charging. You know, the innovation that we can do here. What is it that we can bring to the grid, right? Like how how the flexibility that we can bring, right, to energy systems will actually help minimize some of the investment, you know, into the grid, how we can help contribute to making the grid smarter, uh, more digitalized, uh, more fit for the future, greener, et cetera. That's, that's the positive contribution that we uh, can also bring to the table. It's not really fully in the um, policy domain at the moment in Brussels, but we're hoping to sort of um, uh, push a little bit the importance of that uh, discussion. Now, that's not working very well today, right? Um, when you think of charging, you need to think of us, not obviously we're not a small island. You know, you have the, the grid here and the car here and the EV charging is here, right? So that needs to work. That food chain that I'm describing is an ecosystem, right? And what that means that if one of those <laughs> bits in the ecosystem fails, the whole thing falls down, okay? At the moment, you know, each one of these bits works more or less okay independently. When you start connecting them, this is where you know the real <laughs> difficulties arise. Um, so you have very, very different words. They haven't really learned yet to talk to each other, right? So we are, you know, using different protocols, communication standards, et cetera, et cetera, that's contributing to fragmentation, that's also undermining a little bit what we could uh, you know bring in terms of broader benefits to uh, EV drivers, to the grid. Um, but hopefully that would change. One good thing that would, uh, one accelerator, one potential for accelerator is um, something which is a little bit technical, it's got access to in-vehicle data, not EV driver personal data. We absolutely do not care about that, but data such as, okay, how, you know, um, 
the battery state of charge, you know, how charged is it, what is the temperature of that battery, et cetera, et cetera. For that, you need the car to talk to the um, EV charging uh, sector a little bit <laughs> more organically than we are doing today. Uh, so that's actually a very, very um, big, big priority uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the last point, which is if we really want to make this um let's say ecosystem work well deliver for the driver deliver for everybody in the ecosystem we do need to increase the collaboration uh, along that value chain right so between the grid the charging and the car that will be another uh, of the big uh, big priorities of charge up europe for the next few years thank you very much uh lucy so lucy, to sum up you 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 said that uh the decarbonization is also a private issue and you talked about uh, the grids and the, 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 the importance of uh, the ecosystem uh, uh, subject. Uh, Sarah Shada, um, the floor is yours. I saw that you, you reacted a lot to uh, Lucy's presentation. Yes, thanks a lot, Arthur. Very, very pleased to be here uh, this morning. And thanks, Lucy, for uh, these great insights into um, into charging. Um, yeah, so this morning, I'd like maybe to bring in the perspective of corporate fleets. So I work for the Global NGO Climate Group, um, which is basically working for um against against climate change in different different uh, domains transport being one of the big these big domains and so we have a um, dedicated campaign uh, to tackle emissions stemming from uh, transport um which is ev100 ev100 for uh, so ev for electric vehicle 100 for 100 persons and so basically it is a campaign a global campaign that gathers big companies um, who have committed to make the switch to EVs and to electrify 100% of their fleet by 2030. So when the campaign was created back in 2017, the first joiners were quite like front runners, uh, you know, making such a blunt, um, a blunt commitment. Um, but so now we have uh, a network of 130 companies uh, globally who operate their fleet globally um, as well, many of them um, in the EU, obviously. And so um, it's it's very important. that That's one of the key messages, that it's very important to work with companies, and this is what we do at Climate Group, um, because for transport, um, maybe nice to, to, to remind that 60% uh, of the new cars that are, that are brought into the market are registered by companies. So if we want to seriously um, tackle CO2 emissions stemming from road transport, um, we need to tackle emissions um, that uh, come from corporate fleets, right? And so um, this was quite invisible from the, the political um, developments and regulation, maybe two, two, two three years um, ago. But now it seems that decision makers have identified well the weight of businesses uh, and their importance in um, in uh, helping the, the transition and accelerating the, the transition. Um, so yeah, corporate fleets, big lever to activate uh, if we want to achieve uh, our CO2 emission reduction targets and effectively decarbonize um, road transport. So maybe more specifically, this is what we do with AP100. So basically we work in two capacities. The first one is obviously to convene this network of uh, leading businesses. So I didn't cite any, any names, but uh, to give you an idea, it's like mostly blue, blue chip companies. So we have Capgemini, uh, EDF, IKEA, uh, Coca-Cola, Euro-Pacific Partners. Um, but, uh, this, this kind of, of companies, we try to focus on companies that operate big fleets because obviously we're we want like concrete concrete um, impact um uh, and so the first capacity we work with them on is um to try to capitalize on their experience and do peer learning uh, make them exchange best practices amongst uh, them um so that uh, the ones that are starting their transition can can benefit of the experience of the ones that are a bit more um advanced and that have faced you know different type of issues. Okay, how do I embark my employees on these journeys? Because it's not only a shift of motorization, there's an entire uh, ecosystem and an entire change to be to be driven internally from a company's perspective. So we do that a lot. Um, we bring we bring experts in as well to exchange with companies. We do networking um, on these big issues. 
obviously we we try to profile as much as possible um, their their progress and and to to showcase them as as leaders in the electromobility and and give examples of how they do it. Um, so in the press, in the media, at big events, big platforms as well. All this to send the right signals, both to the market and to decision makers that this is the way forward. And we really need companies to uh, to acknowledge it and to embrace uh, this move and start electrifying their, their um, transport operations. So this is one capacity. And then the second one is the policy hat. So obviously as uh, Lucy said, we need regulatory um, framework and incentives in place to uh, accompany this, this move to, to EVs, right? Um, so this is what we do. And, and it's been it's been very EVs have been very instrumentalized in the in the campaign. We've seen it for, for EU, with, with, we're seeing it in, in France as well, right? Like with um EVs taken a little bit like the pushing ball for the, the conservatives to say no, we don't want this is this is gonna make us lose com competitiveness. Um <clears throat> It's it's uh, it's not it's not just because many people don't have access to to EVs etc. So it's been quite harsh um, the debate on 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 EVs in the election very present and so <clears throat> it's important I think against all these <coughs> voices sorry to bring in the perspective of <coughs> progressive businesses a little pause speaking too much <laughs> I'll be done in a in a minute. Uh, but yeah, to bring the perspective of um, progressive businesses <coughs> to explain that um, we are investing massively in this transition. This is good for our business and we don't want any backtracking, right? We are investing massively. Uh, we're embarking our our employees on this on this journey. <coughs> we're setting up charging infrastructure at our employees' um, uh, houses. Um, yeah, it's huge investment, basically, both from the government and from the private sector that has already started and backtracking would be just a disaster, right? We're just trying to up, catch up the delay that we accumulated with 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 China. China. <coughs> Ooh, sorry. So this is really, <clears throat> really important that we keep in mind <clears throat> that businesses do not want any backtracking. We need stability. Um, so that it is uh, all these efforts of transition are made uh, nicely. And maybe <laughs> I'll finish if I can, if my throat allows. That's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Take your time. Take your time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Um, yeah. So I'll finish very quickly, maybe on the incentives. Um, so Lucy already spoke of some um, regulatory incentives, right? Um, <clears throat> So we have that in place in many regions of the globe, right? So with um, CO2 standards for, for cars that have, have been adopted, of course, in the EU with this 2035 phase out date, right? So past 2035, no more um, no more combustion, new combustion engine cars will be sell um, on, on, on the EU market. In some countries, it's uh, adopted, they start the same trajectory in Australia, we have that, um, they have adopted CO2 standards very recently as well. Uh, in the US, we have um, regulation in place um, too. In China, they started very early back in 2007, uh, and the state invested massively in the in the Chinese transition to EVs, I think $230 billion uh, between two, uh, two, 20, 2007 and now. So it's really, really, really huge. In India, it's starting as well, and we see it with our <laughs> corporate network so regulatory incentives is in place and uh, we need to keep to keep it right <clears throat> in the eu we have the co2 standards for cars and vans we had the co2 standards for trucks that has been voting earlier this year right uh, that imposes a 90 percent reduction of emissions stemming from trucks we have the fair regulation so good signals um in place and so adding to that for companies we have obviously Fiscal incentives as well that has been reinforced in France because this is obviously uh, in the EU still uh, dealt at national level. So uh, the the finance bill for 2024 was was a good good step forward in France for putting more taxes on polluting cars and with with taxes as well specific to to corporate to company cars. Um, <clears throat> And so same fiscal incentive are there. Um, and then obviously for companies, we have everything touching to CSR and reputational um, reputational um, incentives, right? We, we get it from commercial people saying, 
<clears throat> no, we we're gonna we're gonna drive in less polluting cars because it doesn't send a good, good signal to our to our clients, etc. And then CSR, obviously, um, electrifying uh, really contributes to diminishing the CO two footprint um, of of a company, especially when they have when the transport uh, chunk is is a big part of the CO two emissions. So really important to act on this on this um, on this fronts. And maybe I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, I can tell you um, a bit more on the different files we're active on um, at the EU level, especially on the corporate fleet mandate um, that has its resonance in France with, you know, the new reform uh, on, on greening quotas that was introduced with the deputy, uh, deputy Damien Adam. Uh, for now, under the carpet uh, with this uh, SNAP legislative elections, but a very interesting file um, that we've been very active on and will continue uh, to be, um, echoing the corporate fleet mandate. So that's to impose um, <clears throat> quotas um, of EVs in uh, companies' uh, yearly renewals of, 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 uh, of cars. So a very important measure uh, that we'll continue to push for with our network, because it's important to say again, that companies want stability. We have started the transition. They have started the, tr the transition, and they do think that actually imposing quotas would be would contribute to a a, um, a nice and fair distribution of effort, right, on the different actors um, of the chain. Um, so uh, yes, we we came up recently with a position paper uh, backed by almost twenty companies who call for the implementation of a corporate fleet mandate at EU level. Um, so yeah, I can tell you a, a bit more later, but uh, yes, that's the key message um, from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for your, your key message. Thank you. Um, I saw some questions in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe we'll uh, answer this question uh, uh, later. Victoria Leonenko uh, for the French Union of Electricity. The floor is yours. Good morning to everyone, and thank for being uh, the part uh, of this uh, of this event, and especially the participants who uh, decided to participate at 9 a.m. on Friday to listen to uh, about the uh, um, electric cars and electric trucks. Um, I'm uh, also very delighted to be part of this event and uh, to share the perspective of uh, the uh, Union of the French Electricity Industry, and especially French uh, context. Um, Lucy and uh, Sarah um, uh, have said uh, a lot uh, about uh, cars uh, and uh, a lot uh, about uh, policies, incentives, uh, and uh, um, how uh, cars um, has uh, have progressed. Uh, and but I think is uh, another topic that it's uh, important to mention also electric uh, trucks. Uh, it's a new topic. Uh, and uh, uh, we see the with, we see a progress, um, a slow but still progress. And uh, I think it's uh, important to uh, to share with you some uh, some um, uh, key uh, figures that we have on the French uh, market, and especially uh, made by our members, uh, our grid operators, Erto uh, and Edis in France, uh, that uh, have uh, evaluated the grid capacities uh, on the integration of electric uh, uh, trucks. Um, because because it's a, a, a huge topic uh, uh, that uh, if we if the grid can um, uh, integrate uh, trucks uh, and uh, if there is a place for electric uh, uh, trucks uh, because of their uh, huge consumption of electricity um, in general. So uh, just um, uh, some uh, key figures uh, that uh, uh, say that uh, um, actually uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, in, by 2035 uh, only 3% of the uh, consumption of the total consumption of electricity dedicated to electric trucks, and uh, it's in general. Um, uh, and uh, speaking about the charging infrastructure on highways, uh, it will be around 0.5 percent by 2035. So we see that uh, the total consumption of electricity, especially in France, I'm not speaking about other countries uh, in Europe, um, but in France we see that there is there is no topic about the grid capacity. How However, um, as um, by the way, Lucy mentioned, uh, it's a, the, mess, uh, the, um, the very important point, it's smart charging. And smart charging, it's, uh, um, it's a topic that uh, needs to be um, um, 
included uh, for the charging uh, of cars and also the trucks when it's possible. Um, and it's important point uh, to, uh, to mention about the infrastructure uh, and to repeat uh, uh, basically what Lucy said, that uh, um, we speak a lot about uh, public infrastructure and its importance, but not forget that we, uh, the electric uh, vehicles for cars and for trucks, uh, um, the paradigm of uh, recharging uh, has changed. So the user behavior uh, has changed. Uh, we have this uh, huge possibility to uh, diversify, uh, diversify our charging um, uh, in behavior. So to uh, to charge uh, at home uh, or um, at work um, or uh, at the highways or um, in the street where it's possible when we speak about uh, cars and about the trucks uh, at depot, uh, logistic hubs or uh, highways uh, at uh, service stations or even at uh, um, a uh, rest areas. And um, when we uh, cover different uh, um, locations of the recharging, there are different types of recharging is possible. So it's also very important to understand that we don't need to deploy the fast charging everywhere uh, and we don't need to, to do it everywhere. So at home, uh, we don't need to have a, a charging, fast charging as well as uh, for trucks at depot, we don't need to have fast charging. And um, um, this is uh, the um, the main point to also to, to remember that when we have this uh, slow normal charging where we can uh, park uh, cars uh, or trucks uh, for a long time, it's very important to integrate the smart charging technologies. And uh, it's very important, well, we, we, uh, we, uh, we have um, uh, the cars market uh, at least more mature that uh, more mature than uh, um, the market of trucks. Uh, and we, um, I think we need to um, reuse uh, uh, the experience that we have uh, for the deployment of the infrastructure for electric cars and all these uh, incentives that we have and to reuse it we, and improve uh, for the electric trucks. Uh, so the um, so the, 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 the most important for the electric trucks uh, is uh, to evaluate and anticipate uh, evaluate the the needs uh, of the uh, um, of the charging uh, that, for example, we speak about the depot and also about the uh, uh, highways. Um, actually, everywhere <laughs> uh, when we where, where we need to uh, to deploy the um, the charges. Uh, also, we, we need to evaluate. We need to anticipate, and also we need to um, program the deployment uh, of uh, the charging infrastructure. And uh, speaking about the depot, um, um, if we start uh, now to uh, anticipate the uh, pre-equipped Pre equipment, pre cabling, um, the uh, uh, the um, uh, evaluating of the uh, um, power uh, necessity for the uh, for the um, uh, for the charging points uh, uh, for long term, uh, and we if we start uh, the uh, the necessary work now, then the uh, integration of the electric trucks uh, to depot or to highways will be very uh, smooth and uh, and uh, rapid. So it's it's very important to understand and uh, um, and also uh, we we need to choose the um, the good uh, um, and. Um, um, well, the, 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 the good technology. I mean, we need to, uh, for example, uh, uh, install the uh, smart char um, uh, charging point, but with the smart charging uh, technologies when it's needed and also in inter uh, with the interoperability because it's very important when uh, the uh, the cars will be uh, um, a charging with the uh, um, charging points that interoperable and, and they uh, can... Um, uh, have the different, uh, um, well, they have the same user experience. So the users will not have uh, problems uh, with the different uh, uh, charging points uh, in different locations. And uh, well, that's it. About um, the um, incentives, uh, um, um, of course, it's very important to have uh, um, 
uh, regulatory um, um, incentive that we have uh, for for trucks uh, standards of CO2, and I think it's a very important uh, move uh, to uh, decarbonize the uh, uh, the trucks. Um, we have the same uh, for the cars, and we see the difference uh, before and after uh, the standard CO2 for cars uh, uh, has been deployed has been adopted uh, so uh, um, it's it's a good uh, move uh, for the infrastructure we have a fear that uh, covers uh, the boss um, but also it's important to um, take into account uh, its subsidies for the uh, purchase of the trucks because unfortunately trucks are very expensive and uh, we need to remember it that uh, the market is not mature, uh, so it uh, costs a lot. And uh, for example, uh, in France, we had a different uh, um, di different examples of uh, subsidies for the trucks. It was bonus, uh, uh, some uh, reductions, uh, also uh, um, um, a call for a project. And now we have a, a certificate of uh, energy efficiency. I guess it uh, on in, in Europe level European level it's white certificates um, uh, uh, so we will see how uh, it will be uh, um, in practice um, this um, these uh, certificates uh, but the most important is to um, understand that it's necessary uh, to maintain the uh, demand uh, of the um, of the trucks, and um, uh, especially when uh, the market is not mature. Um, and uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to uh, to share with you uh, um, the the document, the pedagogical document that UFO uh, has produced uh, in cooperation with uh, Aver France, uh, with the uh, Transport and Environment, and the ICCT and the Institute uh, Mobility in Transition on um, demystifying uh, the electric trucks because we think it is very important to uh, um, to list uh, all, everything that uh, has occurred and everything that is available in technology on technological on policy uh, level um, about electric trucks and we used only uh, studies reports of official documents uh, to answer uh, the frequently uh, asked the questions uh, about the trucks so the energy uh, disponibility the efficiency uh, the um, batteries uh, the recharging infrastructure uh, and uh, so on. Um, for now, it's only uh, in French. Uh, I hope it will be useful, and uh, I will share the link uh, after after my speech uh, uh, in the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Sure, you can find maybe the link uh, in the chat box uh, or on Zoom. So thank you, Victoria. Yannick Perez, you're a professor of energy economics. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, at Central Superlake School. Thank you very much. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to, to this um, very interesting session with very different topics. Mine is a little bit uh, complementary, of course, because I, I'm not going to re-say what has been said. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, I, I will be sleeping or on holidays. So uh, I will try to, to bring some, some different perspective on, on the debate. <clears throat> My talk will be about vehicle to grid. Um, and uh, mainly because um, there is a lot of discussions these days to know how to use electric cars to do things with. Uh, mobility, of course, to come first. But uh, as the car are parked uh, for a long time, um, for a long time during every day. Uh, most part of the time for uh, regular people, it's parked 22 hours per day. Uh, if you are a taxi, of course, it's uh, six or seven hours per day, but still you are having a sort of storage of electricity uh, that could be used and that could be useful for many different people. And there is a lot of dreams, a lot of uh, expectations, uh, business models, companies, which are saying, okay, that's fine. That's a potential and this potential should be used. And of course, as soon as someone says there is a potential and it should be used, then comes the troubles because everyone wants to use it, but from a different perspective and with different goals and 
of course, assuming that the other ones are okay. And as I'm an economic professor, um, I know that nobody is okay, in fact, <laughs> uh, because everyone has interest. And uh, the idea, of course, is that there is many actors around the table, many actors around the EVs, which are all looking at the same uh, potential resource, but with different lenses and with different interests. Um, let's make a tour. Uh, if you want to use the car, <clears throat> you need first to have a car. So you need an agreement with the car manufacturers. Uh, then you need to know what the drivers will use the car for mobility for. So you need to know what people inside the car will do. And you need to know to whom the data produced by the car and by the user belong to. Uh, is it belonging to the car manufacturer or is it belonging to the owner uh, of the car? Today, uh, we don't really know who is really the owner of the data which is, need, which is needed to know if there is a value for this data. Um, because uh, we make a couple of studies and we show that knowing where the car is is a good data. Uh, knowing where you are going to charge is a very nice data. Uh, knowing both of them uh, is very, very nice data. So the more you have data about what people are going to do and you can know where they are today now and where they will be in a couple of hours and what would be their driving patterns and where they would be connected, you increase the value of data that you can share. But of course, everyone wants to have access to this data um, from the car manufacturer. And, but also from the charging infrastructure point of view, because when you move your car, you need to plug it somewhere. And uh, you plug it at home. So at home, as we have heard already, you don't need uh, a very, very large um, connection because basically you will stay at your place for uh, six, seven, eight hours uh, in order to move a car for uh, 100 kilometers you need roughly 20 kilowatt hour as a maximum, meaning that you drive with uh, climatization, music, all the lights on, you make party inside the car and you up to 20 kilowatt hour. If you have a, a very basic plug, three kilowatt per hour, <clears throat> seven hours, you have 21. And most people in Europe drive 40 kilometers per day. So if you slow charge at home, seven hours, eight hours per day, you cover your daily means without any trouble. Of course, if you have a seven kilowatt plug and seven multiplied by seven, okay, uh, you cover your needs for a week. Uh, if you have a 22 kilowatt hour in your house, which is <clears throat> very, very fantastic, then uh, you plug two hours and that's the deal is done. So, at home, no problems. At work, okay, uh, becomes maybe different because it depends how many hours you stay at work. If it's two hours, maybe you need uh, a higher charging rate. Uh, if you come only for 20 minutes, of course, you need a bigger one. So there is different use, different location, different uh, uh, purpose. And so the, uh, the discussion about Charging infrastructure is always what is the use, where is the place, and who is going to use it. And if you come with the right three dimensions, you will provide a service that makes sense, or otherwise you will provide something which is over quality or under quality. So that's the problem of <clears throat> charging infrastructure deployment. In my talk, we are more dealing with um, the idea of smart charging. So we need long time. The longer the time, the better, because you can do more things than if you are only plugged for an hour. For an hour, you do nothing, nothing interesting, let's say. Unless it's the peak hour, unless there is a very specific problem at its precise moment, but let's say, to make it simple, <clears throat> one hour, you do nothing. Six hours, seven hours, okay. More room for action. We could charge, discharge, we could regulate the charge, we could do a lot of things. Uh, if you are plugged for a week, of course, that's <laughs> holy the time and we can do plenty of very nice things. But the big problem with that is if we look at the actual setup of rules, 
basically you can do nothing um, because you cannot participate in markets. You cannot do anything. So with the actual rules, uh, vehicle to grid is limited to very, very small areas of action. Uh, only You can only do things if you are aggregated by someone. So if you are part of <clears throat> an aggregation body or an aggregation company <laughs> or a building or a house. Uh, maybe, Arthur, you could display my 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 graph. Thank you. Uh, so this is the, the landscape uh, that we, we have built um, with a PhD student to, to try to explain what vehicle to grid is about. Um, so let's let's start with the, the corner where it's written V2H. So it's vehicle to home. The good news with vehicle to home is you can do whatever you want because you are behind the matter and nobody cares of what you are doing in your house. So you could do smart charging at home and smart charging, meaning um, a lot of different things depending on your technicalities, but you could feed your house with your electric car, uh, knowing that you have a battery of 60 kilowatt hours, 70 kilowatt hours, sometimes more, sometimes less, but your daily consumption in house is probably between seven to 10 kilowatt hour. So having a storage of 25 to 100, um, there is room for action. If you see that the price on the market goes up, uh, you could unstore your uh, electricity from your car. <laughs> if in your place you have PV panels, of course, there is a nice complementarity between uh, PV production and uh, home storage. Let's move to vehicle to building. In vehicle to building, uh, of course, it depends on who is running the building. <laughs> uh, if it's a corporate fleet, uh, then you have a professional um, uh, buyer of uh, cars and electricity. So there is a lot of room for action. Um, but if you are um, in the a collective building, then it's more complicated to get a plug. Uh, even if in France you have a rule that says that you have the right to get a plug, this right is more um, an incentive than a real right. So you, you can try to fight all the participants in the building. And after a couple of years, you maybe uh, you will have a plug uh, in your garage. But <clears throat> it's a fight for many years and probably you will find a solution on the street before having a solution in the building. But if you have a smart <clears throat> building, with an aggregator at the building level, there is all the same result that on vehicle to home. You can do whatever you want because you are behind the mayor. So you could deliver services to the building, like uh, helping to manage the bill or helping to reduce the connection fees uh, regarding your connection to uh, the distribution grid or the transmission grid. Of course, where the money is more interesting to be made and uh, opportunities are bigger is when you deliver service on the vehicle to grid, a distribution grid, and transmission grids. But for both of them, <clears throat> you need a complete change or a complete adaptation of the actual set of rules, because the actual set of rules, like always with an innovation, they are done for the past. So basically, uh, innovate, the, the, the systems are not ready for innovation. By, the, by design, they are ready for um, managing what has been done but not what will come. And vehicle to grid is in the part of what will come. We assume that in the coming three to five years, all the cars will be will come with an option to be V2G ready. But of course, we don't know if the electric grids will be V2G ready. We know that the cars will be. The distribution grids, maybe in some places they will be, maybe in other places they don't. Uh, transmission grids, maybe in some places they will, maybe in other places they don't. What is for sure is that on vehicle to home and on vehicle to business, we will find rooms to uh, do some smart charging. With or without the networks is the open question of the next five years, because if <clears throat> no one is moving in the TSO business or in uh, uh, the TSO business, then flexibility will be only played at uh, the behind the mirror level because we don't need regulation for that. 
Uh, we don't need the state to, to tell us what we have to do when we are home or when we are at the business, at the, the, the building level. So my message is like uh, any message coming from an economist. <clears throat> if you find a way to cooperate, you will find a very nice outcome. Um, and vehicle to grid could be displayed in all these places, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, vehicle to buildings. If there is no cooperation, I would say that it will be bad luck for distribution grids and transmission grids, but it will be displayed anyway at the home and the building level because we don't need cooperation with the grids to do that. It will be done by <clears throat> capillarity, let's say, uh, because you have your car, because you have uh, a fleet of cars at the building level, because you have your own car at home, you will do new things. You will manage your electricity consumption in a different way. Just because you will paste and copy your neighbor, which paste and copy your neighbor and so on and so forth. So my message is, world would be better with cooperation. <clears throat> but in these days, we cannot assume that cooperation will take place. And if it didn't take place, it's not a problem for EVs. It will be a problem only for um, grids, which is, of course, a, a big problem. But that's life. No cooperation, no, <laughs> no sharing of benefits. That's life. <laughs> that's Thank, life. You Thank you very much, Nick Bears, for your, for your presentation. Uh, we only have a few minutes to, to discuss it and to, to answer the, the questions. Uh, so maybe, Lucy Matera, uh, if you want to react to, um, to uh, any presentation, or maybe Yannick Perez's uh, presentation uh, about the, the grid, um, maybe and so the cooperation between the different actors, and I will ask you a question from the audience too, and maybe you can answer that. I don't know if you see it. Um, someone said it is very difficult to find reliable numbers of non-private fleet vehicles in Europe. Um, how many commercial and corporate vehicles are active in Europe? What percent are EVs? So I don't have that number on the top of my head, but TNE usually has very good numbers. I know they've done a lot of modeling. Um, so that's mm -hmm. the place where I would start. Um, we don't necessarily agree with all of their assumptions, but they usually have good, yeah, good modeling and they've really looked into uh, that, uh, that particular uh, uh, topic across the, Sarah might actually know more uh, from the, the corporate uh, fleet side. Yes, yes. Thanks, Lucy. No, good, good one. See, I, I posted uh, the link to TNE's, um, TNE's page on, on the chat. Um, so you can refer to that. No, but that's true. Um, and it's quite difficult because what, what you're asking for is actually a picture at the, at the T moment. Um, and whereas for fleets, we tend to, to, re to rezone a bit more in terms of uh, flow than stock, right? So this is the number I gave um, at the beginning of the presentation, right? So 60% 60, 60 of new car registered are uh, corporate corporate cars. Um, and it corresponds to 71% of, of the emissions, actually. So it's it's more because corporate cars are, are used more intensively. Um, so, but yeah, no, uh, a problem in finding numbers, and this is, this is very true, um, especially as companies like are not forced you know to to show these these numbers to show the numbers of their of their electrification uh, percentage um, either uh, that was introduced in France so uh, kind of making it compulsory to to report on your fleet and on on the the, the decarbonizing status of it um, by the loi l'homme la loi d'orientation des mobilités um, and so, but because it doesn't come with sanctions, very, very few companies actually abide by it. Uh, and that's another study uh, by TNE that, that revealed it for uh, 2022 and 2023. Uh, so I think now 60% of companies do not abide by the, the greening quotas that are in the, in the, in the LOM. Um, so, but yeah, in terms of, of, so it would be good to have companies report um, on a more uh, like systematic um, basis. But as a start, definitely you can you can check um, TNE's uh, TNE's link that I've I've posted. Now I can maybe give you a number for uh, EV100 members. So our 130 members have committed to electrify um, five point five million of vehicles worldwide. Um, which corresponds to the integrality of their of their light light vehicles fleet, um, and so far 
uh, achieved. So electrified for sure, we have um, we have six hundred and forty thousand uh, and for, uh, six hundred forty thousand vehicles um, already already um, electrified on the on the roads globally. So then you can you can do a, a small percentage, but for EU, um, I'm afraid we would need to like you know to do some some maths um, to find to find those those numbers. And our panelists sent you a lot of links and resources in the in the chat, so you can find uh, I guess uh, any uh, any any figures uh, in it. Um, as we are taking the questions, maybe I can um, go to the next one. Uh, it's from Dan Wolf. Do you think that an extension of the Eurovignette Directive, so the internalization of external codes from trucks, uh, to private cars could make a major difference in electrification of private fleets? I don't know who can answer this question. Maybe Lucy, Lucy, if you want to take this. Yeah, not, not necessarily in detail, but I think to reiterate a point that has been made before, corporate fleets, it's a very diverse bunch, right? You know, you can have the taxis and, you know, you have like, the the vans uh, who just do uh, deliveries within cities and it's really, really, really diverse. So normally, I mean, we don't like to talk too much about corporate fits in general, just because there's so many different needs, you know, kilometers driven uh, in terms of charging needs completely different. Uh, so I, you know, on, on sort of a conceptual level, I doubt that there would be one solution that would fix the whole thing, right? Um, it's more, but I mean, considering the diversity of needs and challenges, even mm -hmm. for large companies, you know, some large company can, you know, green a corporate fit and then what happens to their suppliers, right? Because they're usually working with like a network of small, you know, smaller network of SMEs who are, you know, also need to have access to the premises and they're the one who will be struggling with the, with the green impact. Okay. So I, in general, don't really uh, think that one solution will, um, necessarily work across all of the segments. Um, but if that works for one of them, then <laughs> definitely you know, that's important. Thank you, Lucy. Um, we don't have so much time, so maybe I will ask you to to conclude, maybe with one sentence or one key message uh, that you want to send to our to our audience, uh, each of you. Maybe uh, Lucy, if you want to uh, to to start, when you go to Sarah. I should be prepared for that. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> do so many panels. No, but I mean, I don't want to leave you on a note that is too gloomy, right? The, the future is electric. I don't think anyone is questioning that. There's, um, you know, transition is always a bit bumpy, but that's the nature of transitions. We shouldn't, um, there's no, I don't think anyone is doubted where we're going. Thank you, Lucy. So if you have any, any comments. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I so the 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 word of the end. I I like um I like Lucy. <laughs> Lucy is the future is electric. Like the future of road transport is electric. That's that's for sure. Um, and so let's let's continue the the good the good regulations that have been put in place with the Green Deal. Um, let's not backtrack. Right, we need to we need to keep keep um moving. Uh, for like everything that can reduce our CO2 emissions, right? Electricity uh, is the best option we have so far. Electri electrification of uses is is, <clears throat> is um, on its way. And so let's let's go for it and let's have a like sound uh, regulatory framework that really guarantees uh, that all the actors can, you know, make the move um, and, and make, make the transition successful. Victoria. If yeah, I uh, yeah I would I I would add uh, uh, the point that um, uh, of course the future is uh, electric, um, and uh, we need to stop questioning uh, the the existence of the technology, and we need to move uh, to the next step uh, uh, to how um, um, apply how to uh, uh, how to uh, how to make it a reality um, and um, uh, we need to uh, to use uh, um, the the good technology to anticipate and program the uh, um, installing of the charging infrastructure for cars and uh, for the trucks um, and uh, we, we we should not forget that uh, smart charging is a part of our reality. And uh, the last but not least, uh, um, we need to understand uh, that it's a new paradigm. We cannot duplicate uh, the experience of uh, fossil fuel cars on electric cars and uh, try to find the same experience uh, uh, with uh, electric cars and trucks. Uh, 
let's stop to uh, to do it and just to realize uh, let's realize that uh, it's a time to to create something new uh, in uh, new reality Yannick Perez if you have a <clears throat> word a key message a key message um, my key message is the, the following <clears throat> uh, don't forget to still do your homework because um, many people say that all the solutions are ready and we just need to apply them. And frankly, I'm looking for this industry since the last 12 years. And <clears throat> some studies are lacking behind. So you tr you cannot convince people just by saying the road is clear. They know that there is some holes in the road. So we need to do some collective homework to pave the way and to make it clear for everyone and the doubts are natural and they can only be defeated by studies and demonstrations and rationality i know rationality is not the thing that people like these days they like simple solutions like the goods and the bads but rationality is not like that rationality is it works until a certain point and after we need to find out a new solution and a new solution to a new problem and we need to go for a, a discovery principle of rationality comes first and then uh, when it is clear for everyone what is the road we can go but we need to put more rationality on the debate otherwise we will do something stupid thank you very much Yannick so thank you very much to everyone. I hope it was an informative and interesting uh, session of policies and practices. You have some links uh, on your screen and you have some links about uh, um, about uh, charging and smart grids uh, uh, from our different panelists in the chat so you can find any information what you want. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, Lucy, Yannick and, and Victoria for being here. Um, we will uh, come back with policies and practices maybe uh, in the autumn so we look forward to 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 see you uh, next time thank you very much